before Nicolaus Copernicus, virtually everyone believed the Earth was the center of the universe. In the early 1500s, Copernicus proved them wrong. Copernicus was the father of modern astronomy. Through his observations, he showed that the Earth revolved and the heavens were stationary rather than the other way around. It greatly simplified our knowledge and our understanding of the universe. He basically took astronomy from a system where we wanted to believe certain things to a system where we could prove that certain things were true. Copernicus was born in 1473 in Torin, Poland, to a wealthy family. He received all the advantages of a great education. He first studied painting and math. He also studied medicine and then later law to the point where he became the canon for a local church. And only later did he develop a keen interest for astronomy. At age 35, Copernicus started questioning the prevailing thought about the universe. The dominant model prior to Copernicus was Ptolemy's model of the solar system, which had the sun and planets moving around the Earth. It was very complex, very unwieldy, and it really didn't work. Copernicus came up with a theory that was extremely elegant in its simplicity, where the sun was the center of the universe and the planets revolved around it. In 1513, Copernicus built his own observatory to further his astronomical studies. Copernicus advanced the idea that the time it takes a planet to orbit the sun depends on its distance from the sun. The farther it is, the longer it takes to go around the sun. A very revolutionary idea at the time. In 1514, Copernicus published a list of seven axioms about the universe. The sun is at the center of everything. The earth goes around the sun. The moon goes around the earth and the stars are much farther away than the sun is from the Earth. Taken together, these seven axioms really provide the basis of modern astronomy. Copernicus's theories were rejected by scholars of his time, and they incensed the Catholic Church. Copernicus's writings were banned from the Church after his death and were not allowed to be read for about three centuries. Copernicus spent his final years defending his work and died at the age of 70 on May 24, 1543. One of the more remarkable things about Copernicus is that he did all of his work with very crude tools. In the observatory that he built, he didn't even have a telescope. He truly revolutionized astronomy. He changed the way we think about everything. All right, a little short video, of course, there on Copernicus, of course, who I'll be talking quite a lot about today, of course. So I want to welcome you back, of course, History 1123. Uh, of course, this week uh, I'm talking about uh, the scientific revolution, and also the age of enlightenment. That's going to be one of our two of our big things we'll get into today uh, and lecture about. Uh, so I want to welcome you all back, of course, uh, this week. Uh, so I hope you all are having a great week. Um, hope you all had a great weekend, of course, last week. Uh, so uh, anyway, it looks like uh, right now we have just Savannah watching right now. Uh, anybody else out there, let me know uh, if you're watching or not live. Uh, or send me comments, questions later, of course, uh, if you watch, of course, record. Hey, hey, Hope, what's going, going on? I uh, hope you're having a great morning, of course, uh, overall. So, yeah, like I said, in today's lecture, I'll be discussing the mostly about the scientific revolution. That's going to be the, the big thing we'll get into today. I don't know if we'll get, we'll get maybe a little bit into the background of the Age of Enlightenment, too, as well. I'll probably start maybe just mentioning a little bit about the famous intellectuals that were part of the Enlightenment, which I think were sometimes called philosophes, if you ever heard the name before, uh, more or less. So uh, anybody, anyway, um, I do, I want to go ahead and start, of course, as I always do, I kind of remind you about assignments. I do have some new assignments, of course, at least one I've put up that's new, uh, did want you to know about. Uh, of course, the um, assignment on that video I, I gave you, on the uh, Battle of uh, Naseby, I think it was the Instruments of Death documentary. Uh, you know, make sure you uh, finish that up, wrap that up this week, because that's due coming up later in the week. Uh, I've been sending out reminders every day about that. Uh, now, your vocabulary, uh, that'll be due next week, which I believe is uh, next Friday, which is uh, March the 19th. <clears throat> so we got plenty of time to work on that. So go ahead <clears throat> and uh, work on that. Now, I do have a, a new assignment. I've got a new assignment, of course, which is a British uh, Canvas quiz, of course, on the uh, history of Britain and all that. We 
have from the previous lectures, of course, on that. So make sure you, um, of course, uh, we'll start working on that. I just posted that this morning. Uh, that'll be due next week. Uh, so that assignment will not be probably on our next exam. I'm thinking that that'll be taken out. Uh, and so like really starting with this period we're doing today, uh, which is the, you know, scientific revolution, age of enlightenment, that's going to be like one of our first topics I'll have later on our later second exam uh, that I'll have. Hey, what's up, David, Christina? Hope you're having a great morning out there uh, also as well. Uh, so anyway, that's like mostly my main uh, reminders. Uh, of course, I have been like working on midterms. I think midterm grades are pretty much due today. Uh, I've already uploaded those. Uh, so I don't know if you had any outstanding assignments you were missing or whatever. Uh, I kind of kind of let you kind of, you know, make up some of those last week, I believe. But I've pretty much done all that. So whatever your percentage is probably right now uh, on Canvas is going to be pretty much your, your grade uh, for the semester or less. All right. So uh, anyway, um, if anybody, by the way, wants to join me in StreamYard.com, there, of course, the link right here below. Uh, if you have any course questions, comments about this lecture during the live stream, let me know. Uh, and I can kind of comment or question, talk about that question uh, more or less a lot quicker that way. Uh, and uh, Or if you wanted to send me comments, questions later about the lecture, of course, through my channel, you can also uh, do that as well. I kind of create a logo, too, if you see that <laughs> to the top right. That's the kind of new stuff I'm doing. So uh, anyway, um, like I said, uh, I'm going to go ahead and first kind of, I will talk mostly today about the um, scientific revolution. I'll get into that first, uh, but I'll kind of kind of go ahead and first talk about like the background of the Age of Enlightenment, because that's the primary thing we're going to talk about, because the Age of Enlightenment really has a major impact on, you know, modern Europe. It totally changes it, especially politically, socially, uh, more or less later. And uh, primarily the Age of Enlightenment, I'll give you the dates on it, but it mostly goes from about uh, the 1700s, usually the late 1700s, it's about when it starts roughly. Uh, and it goes up to like the time of uh, Napoleon, which would be like early 1800s. It says Napoleonic Wars. Napoleonic Wars in about close to 1814, 1815. So that's roughly the period of, although it's mostly in the in the 18th century is where it mostly happens, uh, the so-called Age of Enlightenment. Uh, and uh, it's called different names. You can see Age of Enlightenment, Age of Reason. They call it that. Uh, also, the French had a name for it too. They call it the Century of Lights. You may have heard of that, which is kind of where the term Enlightenment comes from uh, originally. And you can see it was primarily an intellectual philosophical movement that was based on the idea of, you know, reason, empiricism, the ideas of science, uh, more or less, uh, over the ideas of, say, superstitions, uh, the old religious ideas and things like that, that they kind of, you know, destroy, I guess, at that time. And um, these are some of the things that, of course, uh, the, um, enlight the enlightened thinkers you know, favored pretty much. Here's kind of a, a slide, of course, on on uh, the Age of Enlightenment. You can see uh, right there. But um, prim primarily, they favored things like liberty, uh, the idea of progress, tolerations toward others, because uh, people are different, different religions, different cultures, you know, different race, ethnicities, and things like that. The idea of fraternity or brotherhood of among men and things like that was something that they started talking about uh, as well. Uh, the idea of constitutional government uh, is another idea that they kind of, you know, start to kind of push. Republican type governments have become more popular. Uh, you know, separation of church and state is another idea that they also spread. So a lot of a lot of political change. You know, democracy becomes a big thing. They start, you know, studying the old ancient Greek cultures. Uh, they had democracy a long time ago and realized they could have that kind of thing uh, today in modern Europe. And so that had a lot to do with it. So representative self-government, you can see increased civil liberties uh, and the decline of absolutism. So those are all things that, you know, the Enlightenment kind of destroys uh, more or less uh, over, over time. Uh, and, of course, 
we'll get more into it later, but you know, the um, one thing I guess that the Enlightenment did that was very, very famous, uh, if you know much about it, uh, was they created all these different political revolutions, American Revolution, uh, French Revolution, uh, even in Latin America, they had revolutions which overthrew certain authoritarian governments. And so you know, people wanted to create more self-government, uh, more or less, uh, rather than say some absolutist, you know, divine right type king, you know, running everything. So they, they start to kind of go away from those kind of ideas uh, over time. Now, of course, like I said, the scientific revolution, which I'm going to talk about today, uh, of course, is one of the major things that really, you know, influences, uh, you know, um, the Enlightenment later. Uh, and, um, of course, some of these famous scientists I kind of mentioned already uh, at the beginning of the lecture, of course, Nicholas Copernicus, of course, which I'll talk about first. He's, of course, real big. Uh, John Kepler, Galileo, Sir Isaac Newton, those are like the big ones they always talk about. I'll kind of talk about a few other ones that here and there uh, that were also well known. So those are the ones that have a you know major influence on a lot of people, not just in Europe, but like you know throughout the whole world. You know, it just turns the world on on its head. You know, with their with their new kind of ideas uh, at that time. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of uh, talk about some of these different scientists of course, that do, you know, exist uh, at the time, uh, which I told you is mostly scientific revolution, mostly, like I said, occurs between like the 16th uh, to about the 18th centuries, uh, more or less. Uh, and um, yeah, Copernicus, like you saw in the little short little video, uh, was the one that really changed the world. Uh, he's, he's the one that was the so-called, he said, father of modern astronomy, which is true about that. Uh, they talk about the Copernican revolution uh, that occurs. The Cop Copernican revolution was this par paradigm or scientific shift away from the whole, the old uh, geocentric model of the whole solar system. And the fact that long time ago, it was believed that the planets and everything, even the sun revolved around the earth. Well, this goes back to Ptolemy, who I think I mentioned before uh, when I was talking about the Age of Discovery. Ptolemy was this famous, uh, his name, real name was Claudius Ptolemy, who I'll put on the screen for you, was a second century um, Greek, Greek astronomer, um, geographer, who lived in Egypt. And um, I think he told me wrote that book called Geography, if you remember correctly, just one of the first books that had a map of the world. Uh, in it, but he wrote this other book or treatise that was called Almagest, uh, and uh, in that particular treatise, he talks about the idea that the you know all the planets revolving around the Earth and so on. They think some of these ideas went back to Aristotle, uh, the famous Greek scientist who had the idea. I think going back to the time of like uh, I want to say the fourth century, you know, that should be BC, like five six hundred years before he lived, and all that, and so. That's where the name came from, the so-called so term Ptolemaic, you know, model or whatever, uh, which is also called geocentric as well. Well, um, he didn't even use telescopes. Like, or they talked about that, right? A lot of the early astronomers, you know, pretty much used the naked eye. Uh, also, if you know about it, uh, Copernicus and all these other astronomers also relied a lot on um, mathematics. They were math geniuses, you know, and all that. And math, math had a lot to do with them being able to figure out, I guess, also the fact that they're moving, you know, around, around the, around the, you know, solar system is also another idea. And so Copernicus was one of the first to really popularize the idea of the heliocentric model of a solar system where the planets are revolving around a star, which is our sun, of course. And uh, of course, originally uh, his idea uh, if you know about it, uh, what he came up with, of course, he had this work he published. They talked about, I don't know if they mentioned the name of the video, but the name of the work that he eventually does publish after his death is called On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Bodies, uh, sometimes called also On the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres, either one it's translated as being usually. And um, 
If you know about it, it was not published until after his death. Uh, part of it was, I think, due to him worrying about the church, like what they would think of his, you know, work. Um, Cause you know, he was a pol he was a, not just Polish, but he was a priest in the Catholic church and all that. I think he also didn't want to publish it because he thought that his, um, his calculations were quite, quite right. Like there was something wrong with it. And he thought he wasn't, he, he would be criticized for it if he wasn't correct or whatever. And so, because at the time, you know, the geocentric model was more popular and all that. So he was kind of worried about that. Uh, what he did say um, in his, um, of course, work was that what he figured out from his studies was that there were six planets that he could see with the naked eye. Uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter, and Saturn. He also discovered that the moon was revolving around the Earth. So he figured that out. As well. Uh, however, um, Copernicus said that the orbits of all the planets and all that in the moon were like kind of like a 360 degree circle, like perfect circle going around the sun. That proved to be wrong. It proved to be more like elliptical orbit, as of course you'd see later uh, as well. But Copernicus influenced a lot of people, as you know, a lot of different scientists, and, and of course turned everybody's, you know, everything on its head, you know, pretty much with all his, his ideas at the time. So obviously he was ahead of his time, you know, for that period of history, more or less. Uh, here's a um, picture, of course, showing the differences between, you know, the view of Copernicus's idea uh, of the solar system versus, of course, uh, Ptolemy. Uh, you see right there. So all the planets, the moon, the sun and everything revolves around the Earth, including the stars you know, and all of that. So quite different. Uh, I did have another uh, a scientist I wanted to kind of add in there who was also very well known, uh, and uh, that was uh, Tycho Brahe. None of you ever heard of him. He was Danish. Uh, they consider him to be one of the first competent astronomers that comes after Copernicus. Uh, he worked out later on with also uh, Johann Kepler, who was actually um, under him, basically. And um, anyway... Yeah, he's one of the last naked eye astronomers that you have. Uh, and uh, he came up with his own ideas as well, which were kind of controversial uh, also as well. He had a system he called uh, the Tychonic system, which was kind of like, I suppose, a rival, I guess, Copernicus's ideas uh, and also uh, the um, ideas of, you know, Ptolemy uh, that they had, the geocentric versus the, the um, you know, the, uh, Copernican model, uh, and uh, his idea was that the um, sun, yeah, the sun did go around the Earth, uh, but you can see uh, all of it, some of the other planets like Mars went around the sun, so it's kind of a weird kind of system, and I guess he was trying to explain why that was, why some people thought that some of the planets or sun went around the Earth, so he's trying to create like a different kind of model, but that proved to be not correct, of course, later, but it's something that, another idea that of course, some other astronomers came up with uh, as well. Uh, he also wrote a, a famous uh, treatise, which they say is considered one of the first major treatises ever done, like a study of a planet and all that. He actually studied Mars uh, for several years, the planet Mars. I forget how many years he studied, maybe seven years. I forget how many years it was. Maybe, a, no, close to a decade, I think he was studying it. Uh, I know Mars and some other planets. And then... Um, I think it was him that studied, or maybe it was one of those guys. He was studying some of the planets like Mars and some of those. But he studied mostly the stars uh, overall. And he was able to uh, somehow like uh, map or figure out like over 700 something stars that were in the Milky Way uh, that were there. Um, he also discovered the first supernova. Supernova, if you know about it, is the basic star explodes. You know, you know about that. Uh, which I think they call it Tycho Brahe Supernova, found in 1572. Uh, and that's something he was kind of known for. <clears throat> uh, also, um, uh, of course, another famous um, astronomer that's well known, of course, I did want to talk about uh, is uh, John Kepler. Yeah, Kepler's well known, uh, by the way. Uh, and uh, Kepler uh, is actually German. He worked originally with uh, Tycho Brahe, like under him. 
Uh, and uh, he was an um, astronomer, but he was more of a mathematician. In fact, he was a master mathematician uh, under the Holy Roman Empire in Germany, which is kind of an interesting position uh, that he had. And um, Kepler was the one that built one of the first uh, working telescopes uh, in early modern times, called oftentimes called the Keplerian telescope, which used uh, glass lenses instead of mirrors, uh, like you know, most lenses later do. Uh, and uh, actually, I was wrong about that. Excuse me. Uh, Kepler was the one that studied Mars. Excuse me about that, uh, which he did for about 10 years. Confused the two guys. And um, <clears throat> he had a book called New Astronomy, or actually called uh, Astronomia Nova, published in 1609. And um, they think it kind of influenced the ideas of helio, the heliocentric model of the whole solar system as well. Uh, from studying the planet Mars. So, he, yeah, he's the one actually studied Mars, all that. Uh, but Kepler's more known for his um, three laws of planetary motion uh, that he came up with uh, in uh, the 17th century. And it kind of explained, like, why the planets, you know, move around the sun, uh, more or less, which some of these ideas that already, you know, Copernicus had already come up with at that point back in the uh, 16th century. And uh, what he discovered that most, which is famous, you know, about the planet's orbits is that they were elliptical. Uh, they're not actually, you know, a perfect circle like Copernicus originally believed. <clears throat> and uh, he also said that the sun is not in the center of the solar system. It's in like a middle focal point, basically, but not exactly in the center, uh, like people think, <clears throat> you know, at the time or whatever. He also said like... Uh, Second thing, the second law, I guess, is that the orbits are quicker as they move near the sun, <clears throat> basically. And then the third one, of course, is that the orbits vary by distance from the sun. So obviously, like, Saturn's going to be further away uh, than, say, Mars because uh, of the distance between, you know, from the sun and all that. And so their, their actual, you know, year, like our Earth year, say, versus uh, the year on Saturn would be totally different. Because uh, it would take a longer time to go, of course, around around the sun. <clears throat> so those are new ideas that you know were kind of being developed at that time uh, by by, of course, you know Copernicus and Kepler, you know, and Tycho Brahe. All right. Also, another, of course, one of the most famous you know scientists that you know uh, you see uh, later is Galileo, uh, in like, of course, Galileo Galilei, he, you know, who, of course, was, you know, Italian. Uh, and um, Galileo uh, was one of the first major astronomers to really kind of help, you know, prove and popularize uh, Copernicus's theories, uh, especially about the heliocentric model uh, overall. And, of course, I'll get to it later, but Copernicus, you know, gets into a lot of trouble, you know, uh, over that issue. Uh, with the Catholic Church, uh, he actually actually gets it put in front of an Inquisition uh, over that issue, and um, so yeah, he popularized the whole thing, of course, of of the heliocentric model. Uh, he wasn't just an astronomer; he was a mathematician. Uh, he was an early scientist. They think that he may have been one of the first scientists that really starts what we call physics uh, before Newton did. They actually think he discovered the, the idea of gravity, uh, you know, which I think the idea of gravity has been around since going to going back to Aristotle. Aristotle did a lot of ideas, you know, that we have later. Uh, and um, so he also had a bunch of different um, scientific treatises that he, he published mostly on astronomy. Um, he had one called the Starry Messenger. It's well known where he studied some of the planets and all that. But his most famous work he published was in 1632, which is called The Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. What was that? It was this uh, treatise on astronomy that basically compared the two chief systems that people believed in at the time, which was the old one, which was the, uh, the geo geocentric or Ptolemaic one versus the heliocentric one that everybody's starting to talk about, you know, like Kepler and Copernicus. Uh, and so um, he basically favored the heliocentric model. He believed that all the planets were revolving around the sun. 
And as you know, the Catholic Church didn't like this. You know, they had already banned Copernicus's, you know, work at that point. And so they banned that too. They, they banned it, uh, basically. In fact, it was banned for the next couple hundred years. Uh, I think up to like, I want to say the 18th century. <clears throat> and um, but if you know about that time, uh, the Catholic Church was going through the Catholic Reformation. Uh, and they were trying to, you know, crack down on heresy. And so basically they actually arrested Galileo and they put him on trial uh, for heresy uh, against what the church thought was, you know, the truth about the solar system geocentric model. So he, he was put in front of a Roman inquisition. Uh, and after that, he was put under house arrest for almost like a decade. Uh, and um, it's a famous story when he was uh, in the inquisition or whatever, uh, they asked him to recant his ideas about, you know, the planets and how they revolve and all that. Uh, and, um, and suppose he muttered under his breath something like, and yet it moves. He was talking about the earth moving around the sun, all that. So it's kind of a sad story about Galileo, how he you know got treated, you know, later. But now people realize that he was, you know, right about what he was talking about. And now people think he was a you know, great scientist, you know, and all that today. Uh, also, as a scientist, uh, one thing that uh, Galileo was Galileo was very famous for was he was famous for studying like inertia or objects moving in space. Uh, basically, something called the law of falling bodies idea or theory uh, that he kind of came up with. And uh, what he did was he conducted experiments where he used like I think ramps to roll like balls uh, down like hills or something like that. And he was trying to see how they accelerate in space amount of time it takes and all of that. He also took some objects they believe and dropped them off like buildings to see, you know, what would happen when objects would, would accelerate. And there's a famous story where he supposedly did experiments with the Tower of Pisa in Italy uh, where he dropped spheres off, you know, the actual tower, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, as it's called. And, um, and he found out that no matter how, you know, different size, you know, the objects, they tend to accelerate at the same time, uh, which most, you know, scientists now think it's due to gravity, the influence of gravity, you know, on objects as they fall in space and all that. But Galileo and other scientists didn't understand that at that time, like why objects moved in space and, and so on. So that's Galileo. Uh, Galileo, very influential, of course, uh, like I said, uh, with the um, scientific, you know, revolution uh, as well. All right. Also, some other scientists I wanted to talk about uh, that were very important uh, as well uh, is um, I want to also include a man you may have heard of named Francis Bacon uh, or Sir Francis Bacon, as he's called, who lived between the 16th and 17th centuries. He's, he's very important also in the early in science, scientific revolution, and also in modern science today uh, as well. Uh, and um, Bacon was an a English philosopher primarily. He wasn't really a scientist, by the way, uh, which back then they didn't really use that term, scientist. Uh, I think most scientists were called philosophers. Uh, science itself was called natural philosophy, uh, and they grouped everything together, like all different branches of what we call science or whatever, math, any kind of, you know, subject, even history, you know, would be thrown uh, into forms of natural philosophy uh, in general. And of course, what Bacon is very famous for, he's the one that kind of popularized the whole scientific method, uh, which, and so quite often he was called later the so-called, you see, the father of empiricism. Uh, and um, some people, of course, refer to it as originally the Baconian method. That's interesting about that. They, of course, named it after him, but it obviously wasn't very popular, uh, the term. And so over time, it became basically scientific method, as they call it now. I guess he was made fun of, this name, Bacon. <laughs> you think about the name. But uh, anyway, um, so... Yeah, uh, so he basically believed that scientific knowledge, you know, could come from observation of nature. This kind of went, you know, against the old beliefs before, 
where everything was like based on superstitions and the you know supernatural things and God doing this and God doing that, you know, like in the Bible, or whatever. So this totally went against those kind of ideas uh, overall. And uh, so, yeah, one of the first things that you want to do the scientific method is obviously to ask a question, like a problem, like what's what, what exactly are you trying to study exactly scientifically or whatever. Uh, then you do research on that question, obviously, using history too as well, like doing a research paper or whatever. You come up with some kind of hypothesis, uh, which you want to write about. Uh, then you do an experiment. Uh, then you do some kind of observation. Uh, conclusion. And then you obviously, after that, you would publish your work, paper in a book or whatever it would be. Uh, and that's basically the basically the premise of how the scientific method, you know, pretty much is works and still is used today, uh, pretty much in science and I guess in other fields uh, also as well. So that's why Francis Bacon's kind of important. Uh, also, one more thing about Bacon I did want to mention, which is famous as well. Bacon and this other man in France named uh, Michel de Montaigne, if you know about him, uh, were the ones that first popularized the ideas of using what they call an essay uh, to, uh, you know, write, you know, scholarly type arguments about whatever ideal you're writing or maybe historical stuff, whatever you're doing. Could be science, could be math, could be history, could be English, whatever kind of subject it is, uh, writing an essay. Uh, and S, uh, Bacon was known for a bunch of different essays uh, that he wrote, like essays of truth, uh, essays of religious meditations and things like that, uh, subject wise. And Michel de Montaigne in France also had something similar to that uh, as well. So both both popularized the use of the essay uh, by the 17th and 18th centuries after that. Uh, also, another scientist I wanted to add in, too, who's also very famous and also, of course, a big, big philosopher, mostly, uh, of course, is Rene Descartes, uh, who lived primarily around the 17th century. He's pretty important also with the scientific revolution and later the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, he, of course, was a French philosopher primarily, uh, but he's also seen as a scientist and mathematician. Uh, he, of course, was heavily involved in influences in geometry, uh, if you know about that. And uh, he lived, he, and though he's French, uh, he lived his, most of his life uh, in uh, the Dutch Republic, which was kind of going through a golden age at the time, around the 17th century. And so he kind of had an influence in, in not just in the Dutch Republic, but in European thought, uh, more or less. And um, Descartes is important because he's considered to be the so-called father of modern philosophy. Uh, emphasize, you see there, rationalism or reason, which pretty much the Enlightenment was about, you know, later uh, between the 17th to the 19th centuries. So they'll emphasize more on, you know, uh, reason, rationalism uh, over, say, emotions or, or superstitious ideas and things like that of the past. That was, you know, dictated by religious ideas uh, and so on. Uh, and um, he's famous for a bunch of works you may have heard of, like Discourse on Method uh, and also Meditations on First Philosophy. Uh, that's well known. Uh, and, um, of course, Descartes is, you know, very famous for that quote, he said, which was, I think, therefore I am, uh, or Cangito Ergo Sum. Uh, and um, that was this idea uh, that um, basically, you know, because you can think, you know, you got a brain and all that, that means you must exist. You know, your ideas are real and all that. Uh, and so uh, that was a new idea that he kind of, you know, uh, developed, which was kind of very popular uh, in all that. Also, like I said, he was influential, like in mathematics as well. As you know, he's the father of what they call analytical geometry. Uh, and he's one to kind of develop the so-called Cartesian coordinate system, which is named for him, or at least it's named for his Latin name, uh, which is um, Renatus Cartesius. Here's the name of where it comes from right there. And you can see it's in the background <laughs> with the picture. I think, therefore, I am I like that. Uh, so so that's basically, you know, Rene Descartes. And so Descartes, Descartes had a lot of influence on, you know, like I said, math, science, you know, philosophy uh, in general. 
All right. Then, of course, they have the scientist they always talk about, of course, that's you know very, very well known. Of course, the greatest scientist really of this period, of course, some people think the greatest science, scientist of all time, uh, of course, which is Isaac Newton. Uh, and so there's, there's Isaac Newton right there. I do have a little short video I'll show on Newton. It's not that long, but it's like a maybe. Um, just kind of a background on it. Isaac Newton, of course. Um, and um, so I want to kind of go into a little bit about him, uh, his life, uh, of course, what he was very famous for uh, as a scientist. Of course, so Newton, Newton, like I said, uh, was born in the 1640s. You can see he was basically born about the same time, by the way, when the English Civil War uh, was kind of breaking out, uh, more or less. And um, you can see he was born at a place called Woolsthorpe, Woolsthorpe, England. Uh, and um, he would, of course, eventually go on to, uh, like I said, uh, study at the University of Cambridge, which uh, it's really a bunch of schools, of course, there uh, that he was associated with. But um, father of modern science, physics, modern calculus, uh, primarily uh, Newton attended what became known as, of course, today, the famous Trinity College, which is part of the Cambridge University college system. It's actually not one school, Cambridge. It's a bunch of you know colleges in, in Britain that are kind of part of that, part of an umbrella of schools. And um, Newton um, was big into like studying like math mostly, but also later into science as well. He also studied things like light, uh, and and of course also was big into like astronomy, uh, as you'll see later. Uh, and um, you can see at one point for about a little over three decades, he was the Lucasian professor of mathematics at Trinity College. That was, by the way, a very prestigious position, but still there, chair, which was held by Stephen Hawking for a bunch of years uh, when he was alive. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, Newton um, was, was famous uh, for uh, developing, like I said, modern calculus. He and this other guy named... Gottfried Leibniz, of course, developed calculus. We call it mostly infinitesimal calculus, which you see there is a mathematical study of continuous change. Uh, and um, so about simultaneously, although they think that Newton may have developed it earlier uh, when he was studying at Cambridge, uh, they believe, but he didn't really publish the ideas until like the early 1700s. Like I think I want to say, I think it was 1704 uh, when he published his ideas on calculus originally. Uh, of course, his big breakthrough, uh, if you know about it, uh, of course, is the so-called Principia uh, that he published in 1687. That's really considered his magnus opus, his greatest work, of course, he ever published on any kind of science, 
which is the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. And this particular groundbreaking work, of course, uh, is the one that kind of pretty much created the whole background for what would be modern science today. Well, your ideas of modern physics, you know, go into it uh, more or less. And it talks about, like I said in the video, about, you know, his famous laws of motion uh, that he was, of course, known for. Uh, and it also talked about his theory of universal gravitation, or also called gravity for short, uh, which he tried to explain also uh, in that work as well. Uh, of course, if you want, these are the so-called laws of motion. Uh, I, mean, I don't know if you really have to know those, but those are the three, of course, they mentioned in the video. Yeah, every object stays in motion. What is a change by a, of course, external force? That's, of course, law number one, the laws of motion. Number two, force equals mass times acceleration, which you've heard of. Then law number three, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, which they mentioned a little in that little short video uh, as well. Of course, his theory on gravity was kind of controversial. Uh, a lot of people didn't, he didn't really explain like why it occurred. You know, why does one object attract each other? That was kind of controversial uh, at the time. But it's believed that objects moving in space were kind of attracted to each other. Uh, like, you know, the Earth going around the sun or the moon going around the Earth, things like that. Uh, and, uh, of course, the story about the how he discovered gravity is a story where it's supposedly uh, when he was at his home in Woolsthorpe, um, I think taking a break, like from school, like in college, he saw an apple fall from the tree, but they think it's a made-up story. You know, they, 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 it never really happened. And he kind of like at his old age kind of just invented it. And so they think the apple story might be like an apocryphia story that he kind of invented to just kind of explain how he came up with the idea in his head, more or less. Uh, Newt was also obsessed with studying light. If you know about this, uh, he, he used like mostly prisms uh, to study light where he put light into a prism. And what he figured out about light was that light was not just white light. It was composed of multiple different colors of the light spectrum uh, in general, which we know is now kind of, uh, you know, seven different colors, red, orange, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, sometimes abbreviated for Roy G. Biv, right, uh, as you know. And uh, most people did not realize that. Like A lot of people still don't realize that today, believe it or not. Uh, but he, he was one of the first to kind of figure that out, uh, which he published that later also as well. Uh, also, Newton was known for developing one of the first reflecting telescopes, uh, which used mirrors instead of glass lenses, uh, which he invented in 1668 later called the so-called Newtonian telescope. And uh, the Newtonian telescope um, was considered the, the archetype or prototype telescope to modern telescopes, which are used today, because all telescopes now use mirrors instead of lenses, uh, which is more clear. Um, a lot of his ideas on like, you know, optics and light and all that uh, was published in another book. His other big book is called Optics, you may have heard of. Uh, published in 1704, and it's in that book where he put his theories on calculus in it, where he published it uh, in all that. Uh, Newt was kind of controversial, though. He had some kind of weird ideas. Uh, like, if you know about it, he studied alchemy uh, during his lifetime, like for a bunch of dec decades, uh, which they think was kind of like a form of early chemistry and all that. But he was trying to, supposedly trying to find what they call the Philosopher's Stone uh, and all that. Uh, which was supposed to be the key to immortality or enable people to turn any kind of substance into gold. And it's kind of a weird story about Newton uh, that most people don't know about. He was also very religious. That's one thing people do not know about Newton. Very religious. He actually studied the Bible trying to figure out when the end times would come. And he actually claimed that the end of the world would come in the year 2060. And something that he's kind of famous for. A lot of people don't know about that. On uh, his later years, he was a master of the he was a master of the mint, like in Britain, uh, by cracking down on counterfeiters. Uh, believe it or not, he was also a member of Parliament. So he, he was a jack of all trades uh, and all that. But considered one of the greatest scientists uh, in uh, in history, uh, more or less. So 
So anyway, yeah, we're kind of we're kind of talking about, of course, uh, all these different, you know, uh, scientists that you know had a had a major influence uh, on on not just that period in, in like modern times, modern science, but of course, like I said, it also influenced like you know pretty much uh, the so-called age of enlightenment uh, that'll come in next. So I need to talk about, of course, how all these different scientists and so on affected them. You got these different intellectuals. Uh, that come in uh, with the Age of Enlightenment uh, that are known as the so-called philosophs, as their their nickname. I'll kind of talk for a few minutes about them today, about who they were, uh, basically. Uh, the term philosoph uh, is a French term. It means philosopher, uh, basically. Uh, and they weren't really philosophers like we think of, like, you know, like so Socrates or, you know, Plato or something like that. Uh, they're more like these intellectual types that wrote like a lot of books and letters and things like that, essays or whatever. And they tried to influence people like culturally, politically, uh, et cetera. Uh, most were French, you can see, uh, but some were like American, other Europeans, uh, et cetera, uh, that were involved. And they did have a nickname. A lot of the different uh, philosophers were often called Republic of Letters. So say men of letters. Uh, the Republic of Letters is the common thing uh, that they were often called. And they were called this because they uh, wrote to each other like across like geographic boundaries, like throughout Europe, throughout the world, uh, like in America and other places. Like so they had no boundaries. No, so no boundaries, you know, no borders barred them uh, pretty much. And so there was like a lot of con correspondence going back and forth uh, between each other you know, between the 16, 1700s and all that. And you see there on the bottom, Voltaire supposedly wrote something like 20,000 letters to people. That's ridiculous. There's like, they, have, they actually have all of them still, all of his letters he wrote. There's like 102 volumes of letters that Voltaire wrote uh, to people. And they wrote to all kinds of people. Like you had these different thinkers writing to different like monarchs, like Voltaire writing to Catherine the Great, you know, or something like that. Or Frederick the Great, who Voltaire was like close friends with, uh, more or less. So they tried to write to people, you know, influence them uh, and all that. And so uh, these these intellectuals, you know, had a major influence uh, on people, you know, later. Uh, not just the Enlightenment, but modern times, you know, uh, over time. Now, the uh, Enlightenment, uh, they the, these philosophers favored different ideas. Uh, that they had that were real, real popular. These are the ones right here I'll give you. But basically, they favored reason is the big one. Number one, that's the one, of course, the most. Talk about the ideas of empiricism, rationalism, you know, we're talking about. Uh, they believed that if, you, if reason was used, uh, society would be a better place. And it wouldn't be all based off of like old superstitions and uh, the way things used to be with, you know, medieval Europe in general, say religious ideas, uh, nature, the idea of nature, uh, that nature is what dictates the universe, natural laws, uh, things like that uh, dictate everything. Uh, happiness, the idea that, you know, um, people's lives should be happy. You know, the government should be there to make people happy, not miserable uh, in general. Uh, so pursuit of happiness, which uh, Thomas Jefferson talks about later, like in the, you know, Declaration of Independence as an example. Progress is another one. They think that if changes can be made, reforms and all that, you can have progress in society, improve society, uh, less oppression, things like that. Uh, and then liberty, of course, one of the big ones. That's probably the second big one, you know, besides reason is liberty. That's the idea that, you know, people have democratic ideas, you know, to to have self-government uh, and things like that. Uh, and these are ideas that, you know, influenced a lot of people, especially with like political revolutions that come later, American Revolution, French Revolution, even the Latin American revolutions were influenced by a lot of these ideas of these enlightened thinkers at the time. Uh, also, the um, one thing about the philosophers, uh, they kind of were an somewhat anti-Christian, some of them. I know Voltaire did not like the Catholic Church, <laughs> you know about that. Uh, and uh, a lot of the uh, philosophers were what they call deists. Uh, they, they, they practice what they call deism. 
the deism was this idea that well, it was a philosophical belief. You can see that rejected revelation, supernatural ideas. Uh, it's kind of like this anti-Christian type religious idea that there is a supreme God, you know, that dictates the universe. Uh, actually, what well, well, creates the universe, but doesn't dictate it is actually what it is. So it's like, you know, it's the architect, supreme architect, I think was a, they all call it all kinds of names, uh, God, but supreme architect or supreme clock, you know, of the universe. And the clock is wound up basically and then let go, you know, by God. Uh, and then everything else is kind of um, governed by natural laws. So great clockmaker, supreme clock, or sometimes a great architect. It's got all kinds of nicknames, I think. I think great clockmaker is the common name. I think that the deists would kind of call God uh, more or less. And so there's just not this idea that God's, you know, sitting there deciding, you know, hey, you're going to die tomorrow, <laughs> that kind of thing, you know, and all that. It's just stuff just happens because of natural laws uh, in the in the universe. So that's that's the idea of you know what the philosophers believe. But of course, some viewed it as being this anti um, anti you know Christian or anti Catholic I know, type religion. Uh, and so a lot of your you know Catholic Protestant sects didn't really like deism. Uh, if you know about it. Uh, and so actually, in the 1800s later, they tried to stamp it out. Uh, you know about which a lot of it has been stamped out, uh, you know, but you still got people today, modern times, that still, you know, believe in deist ideas uh, overall. Uh, and um, some of these are surprising. Like if you think about it, I don't know if you heard much about these, but these are probably the most famous people I can give you that were like, you know, deists at one point. Benjamin Franklin was a deist, they think. Thomas Jefferson. Voltaire was probably the biggest one. Uh, that was that was a deist uh, that you really hear about. He didn't really like I said like the Catholic Church uh, thought it was corrupt and all that. Adam Smith also as well. Thomas Paine, you probably heard of him. He wrote Common Sense. James Madison, the guy that wrote pretty much the U.S. Constitution. Uh, I got Thomas Paine there twice. I don't know why. Uh, Maximilian Robespierre, uh, of course, he's kind of controversial, you know, because he was involved in the. French Revolution, but the French actually tried to bring it back in the 1800s with a deist cult. I'll talk about later, which didn't really work out. Um, but basically, um, a, lot of those, a lot of those kind of men were, were the types of people that were, you know, uh, involved in, you know, um, these different, you know, philosophical ideas uh, at the time. Now, later, I'm going to talk about some of these other types of um, philosophers we'll have. I'm going to, I think coming up, we'll, we'll talk about John Locke next. We'll get into him. We'll talk a little bit about John Locke next week. Uh, excuse me, this week on Thursday, I'll get into him. Uh, I'll also talk about Voltaire. I'll mostly talk about Voltaire the most because Voltaire was the one uh, that really was the most famous of the different enlightened thinkers uh, at the time. Uh, so I'll get in him. His real name was Francois Marie Arret, but he went by the pen name Voltaire. So we'll talk about him. Uh, I'll talk about also um, Dennis Diderot, who probably was not a deist. <laughs> he kind of controversial. He was an atheist, which for the time, 18th century, was kind of controversial. We'll talk about uh, Baron de Montesquieu. He was another philosopher. Uh, we'll also talk about Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, as well. And then I'll get into also uh, a little bit about, of course, Adam Smith, who was considered also a philosopher, although he was really considered to be, uh, Adam Smith was really, like an Amer uh, he was really Scottish, you know, uh, and was more known for economics and all that. But he he was also kind of considered like a philosopher. So all these different philosophers can be considered to be, you know, not just like, say, French, but they were kind of a combination of different Europeans and Americans that were associated with it. I think on Thursday, if I have time, I might even, if I do have time, I, I might even start talking about the French Revolution or at least some background on the French Revolution. But uh, before I go today, I did want to remind you uh, that I do have this new assignment up that's been posted. So don't forget about it. It, of course, is on the 
British, you know, that those I think it was three lectures on the British ahead history, which covered from the um, Tudor dynasty up through the Stuart dynasty period. Then up, I did talk about some of the minor dynasties in there. I've got a few questions in there too, uh, which is about the Hanover and the Windsor dynasties. So make sure you don't, you know, forget about that uh, and get that done. Because uh, that's due next week, but primarily this week you've got the video quiz on the Battle of Naseby from that series I told you about uh, that I wanted you to watch, uh, which was the uh, Instruments of Death, uh, which kind of go more into like the battle and the kind of weapons they used uh, in the English Civil War. And then second voc vocabulary is due next week, which is next next Friday, which I think is March nineteenth, uh, more or less. So I'll kind of I'll kind of keep reminding you about some of these assignments that are that are upcoming, but. Pretty much we're starting into like the second half of the semester. Uh, of course, I'll be having like an upcoming second exam later on, either end of the month or beginning of April. I'm not sure which it will be uh, more or less, but it's going to cover from the scientific revolution. We'll probably get up to like the 19th century, most likely, where our second exam is going to end. So that's it for today. Uh, if you have any, like I said, any comments, questions about this lecture, let me know. Uh, I don't think I have any questions today. Wouldn't too many people watching today, looks like it. But uh, let me know later if you have any comments, questions uh, about, of course, this lecture or any lecture uh, overall. So y'all have a great rest of the week. Uh, so like I said, on Thursday, I'm going to kind of wrap up and talk about the rest of the Age of Enlightenment and get into all the famous philosophers that were well-known, like Voltaire, uh, during that time. And I'll see you then. So take care. So y'all, bye.